This episode of the Wild Fed Podcast is brought to you by Sir Thrival. Are you looking for a clean, potent, well-researched CBD product, but tired of sifting through shelves of dubious, cheaply made, untested formulas? Sir Thrival's CBD3 line is three CBD extracts in one. The first is a highly researched nanomolecular water-soluble extract. The second is a scientifically validated, liposomally delivered CBD, and the third is a full-spectrum organic hemp extract to round out the formula. All are made to exacting nutraceutical standards and combined in one liquid formula. There's no better CBD product available anywhere. You can find CBD3 at surthrival.com. I'm Daniel Vitalis, and you're listening to The Wild Fed Podcast a show about reconnecting with nature through hunting, fishing, foraging, and food. Wild Fed. Food is all around you. Today's episode, episode number six, is with Paul Greenberg, author of Four Fish, The Future of the Last Wild Food, American Catch, The Fight for Our Local Seafood, and The Omega Principle, Seafood and the Quest for a Long Life and a Healthier Planet. First, though, head over to wild-fed.com or to the Wild Fed YouTube channel to check out the trailer for the upcoming Wild Fed TV show, which will be launching on January 6th of 2020. I've been working on that show for a couple of years, and I'm really excited to get it out there. But we're self-produced, and we've got no big networks or big platform support, so the only way you can see it is to purchase the season at our website. Pre-orders are available now, and you can see the trailers for the season and all the individual episodes there. We're also launching the Wild Fed Season 1 Experience, a nine-week interactive program that includes the video show, but comes with extras, exclusive live Q&As, and a private member group moderated by me and the Wild Fed team. There's already a great group of people signed up, so get in there while you can. The opportunity to sign up ends on January 5th. The program is a great way to start your new year. Now, today's show. As an adult onset angler, one of the things I've struggled to sort through in my learning process is the state of our oceans, our fisheries, and of course, what seafood is safe and sustainable to eat. If you peruse the available books on the topic, it won't take you long to find the highly regarded works of today's guest, Paul Greenberg. Paul was kind enough to sit down with us and share his perspective on the only wild animal foods still broadly available in our commercial marketplace, fish and seafood. I've learned a lot from Paul's books, both reading them and listening to them in audio format, and if you haven't already read or listened to them, I highly recommend you follow up this interview by doing so. They're an essential crash course for the adult onset wild foodist, particularly for those of us who make our way to sea level and below. As always, I'll be back next Tuesday with episode 7, a solo show all about learning to explore the wild food shed where you live. So be sure to tune into that, and while you're listening to this episode, please head over to iTunes or your favorite podcast app and leave me a five-star rating and a review. It's great for morale here at Wild Fed Headquarters, but even more so, it lets the podcast platforms know that you like the show and they reflect that with better rankings. That means more great guests for you to listen to. We want to keep helping you by bringing you outstanding content, and you can help us in return by leaving that rating and review. Now enjoy this awesome interview with Paul Greenberg, and I'll talk to you next Tuesday on the Wild Fed Podcast. All right, I am uh, here with Paul Greenberg in New York City's and Manhattan's financial district, which is a funny place to be conducting this interview. How are you doing today, Paul? <laughs> yeah, it's funny, but you know, it's the first seaport of uh, of America, really. It's yeah. where all the fish first came in. So. Yeah, it's true, right? I've kind of been learning a bit. Uh, I think uh, you, you talked kind of at length about the oyster yeah. Situation here, which really blew my mind. Uh, we got to my right, Grant Giuliano, hey, producer of the show. Thank you for being here, Grant. Um, Paul, I have read uh, Four Fish. I've read American Catch. I've read The Omega Principle. These books have been really informative for me and helped me develop a more well-rounded uh, worldview um, as it relates to fish, fisheries, and fish consumption. Um, well, they are the Game of Thrones of, yeah. of seafood. <laughs> yeah, you know, exactly. I mean, I've been... You know, touring Hollywood all day, trying to, you know, beat off the producers, but yeah. How'd you end up being a writer on fish? You know, I grew up fishing. um, My, probably the reason is when my parents divorced, um, my dad, uh, you know, really knew nothing about fatherhood. You know, it was the 70s, right? So men weren't really supposed to know anything about fatherhood. And um, my dad had it in his mind 
that a father should take a son fishing. Yep. <laughs> but he didn't know how to fish. <laughs> he didn't know how to fish. And in fact, you know, he often asked his father to take him fishing. And my my grandfather was like a Willie Loman type salesman and never had time taking fishing. So when my parents got divorced, my dad was like, well, now I'm going to step up and I'm going to be a dad and I'm going to take my son fishing. And because my dad really didn't know about fishing, I quickly outpaced him as yeah. a fisherman. <laughs> and, you know, kids, boys, especially, you know, I'm raising an 11-year-old or 12-year-old now. And, you know, boys like to be in charge, but not fully in charge. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was like that was um, licensed to kind of go out and, and explore the ocean. Um, and the writing about fishing actually also came about in part because of my dad. Um, I was um, an avid reader of um, – you know, a flimsy paper uh, publication, weekly publication called The Fisherman. And there was a New England edition and a Long Island edition. And um, before I turned, became a teenager, I used to send pictures of myself in withholding giant fish. <laughs> okay. But then when I was about 16, my dad said, um, you know, why don't you write for them? And I said, well, you know, I can't write. I'm just a kid. And he's like, no, no, write it. So I wrote an article about, called, it was called Bones and Albies in the Vineyard Surf. And it was about <laughs> Benita and Albacore yeah. in, in Martha's Vineyard where we used to fish. And my dad helped me edit the piece, and you know it was before computers, so he actually typed it up, and uh, we sent it in, and they they took the article. Oh, and wow. it was like I, I think how old I, were you? I was sixteen, and okay. I think I think I got like fifty eight dollars for it. Or, oh or yeah, something, no you know? kidding. Okay, <laughs> as, as as my grandfather said, that was a lot of money. Yeah. Was, it actually wasn't. <laughs> but um, but you know, and I remember feeling like in a panic that some they were going to match up the author of this article with the kid holding up yeah. this striped bass, you know, from a couple of years back. Anyway, so that that and then I sold another article to them, and um, but you know, I took a little dog leg away from that. I was actually a Russian major in college, and I was mm. um, did a, a environmental policy in the former Soviet Union, and I made some documentaries. No there. way, really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So a whole former life, a whole former life in former countries, and um, uh, but you know. Uh, around my 30s, um, I quit my job. I actually wrote a novel, sold the novel. Oh, no kidding. And then it was like, you know, I, always, I think I say in my book, Four Fish, that, you know, the desire to pursue fish is inversely proportional to your desire to pursue females of your own species. <laughs> so, like, you know, when I was like eight or nine, I was really into fishing. Yep. And then I like hit 16, and then yeah. sex started going yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. And fishing, fishing started going dropped down. away. But, you know, 33, 34. Yeah. You know, it's swinging like, back. <laughs> swinging back. And then, you know, in my 30s, I really developed uh, the desire to fish again. Yeah. And um, I started fishing. And that's when I sort of started to understand the you know the, the the really troubled state of the ocean mm -hmm. um and i started writing about it professionally I, after i'd written my novel a um, bunch of editors first at the boston globe and the new york times took note of my writing and knew that i liked fish and they you know they asked me to write so you know from from there on i i wrote various articles and there was this whole thing that happened in the early 2000s there were these big think tanks that started churning out these sort of alarming uh, yeah. science articles about the ocean, which you've probably read, but, you know. Too many of, yeah. <laughs> you know, too many of, but they really started to kind mm -hmm. of um, blossom in the early 2000s when you had people like Graham Myers and Boris Worm publishing these papers like 90% of the big fish gone, um, no seafood by 2040, all these kind of very gloomy and doomy things. So inevitably, the New York Times in particular was like, well, what do we do with that? You know, how, how do we explain that to the public? And so I was there. And there was a kind of space available in the media at the time because, you know, Michael Pollan, whose work I greatly admire, had really done land food. But, you mm -hmm. know, thankfully for me, there's, I don't know if you remember in Omnivore's Dilemma, there's a part when he writes his wild uh, food part of his... Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't remember now. In, in Omnivore's Dilemma, the fourth part is wild food. Yeah. And it's worth revisiting for your yeah. podcast purposes. But he kills a pig and, you know, eats it and stuff. But he's sort of weighing the options yeah. about what he's going to do for his wild food. He's like, well, I could go fishing. He's like, don't go fishing, don't go fishing. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, nah, I'm not going to go fishing. So he left the field, you know, kind of wide open. Okay. And I realized that, you know, there were lots of people doing food politics of land food, but nobody informed enough to do food politics of the ocean. Mm -hmm. So there was this space. I mean, years later, I remember seeing Michael uh, in Berkeley. We were like, you know, went for coffee. And, uh, you know, and Michael was just looking really good, you know. And, uh, you know, he was just cresting. You know, he continues to crest, but he was just looking really good. And I was like looking at myself and looking at his clothes, my clothes. <laughs> and, I was, and then it occurred to me, you know, we eat 200 pounds of land food meat 
per year, but only 15 pounds of seafood. Uh, that's proportionate. And, and I was like, I was like, I, is this how our, our royalties play out? <laughs> And I, I oh, think there, may, I think there be maybe something, <laughs> there might to, be that. something to it. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, but that said, Michael Zoe has been very generous, and you know, we've done some stuff together over the years. So, anyway, so that's how it happened. So, long, long answer to a short question. And and before I dig into your uh, books, um, what kind of fishing do you like to do? You know, uh, I'm not an elite fly fisherman, mm-hmm. dude. I can hold a fly rod. Um, I had actually, you know, last year, two years ago, I made a documentary with fr- a frontline documentary, and um, we were in Norway and. They wanted me to have this f- shoot the scene of this pastoral film of me casting right. uh, for salmon. For salmon. And have you fly fished before? Yeah. So have you ever spay cast? No. So do you know, even know what spay casting is? Is that like a where you have to roll it because you got something behind you? Well, no. Normal fly ra- fly casting, you do let the line unfurl behind you and you yeah. use that. To no, I'm saying when you can't do that because right. you've got like something behind mm, you. Well, that's a, that's a roll cast when you okay. just, no, okay. spay casting is this weird form of, of, um, of it's kind of, you almost make like a figure eight with your arms uh, okay. and use the tension. Oh, and on you've got the, a longer rod yeah, handle it's for that, right? Yeah, super I know long. You're okay. But you're using the tension of right. the water to load, to load the rod, the, to load the rod. So it's totally counterintuitive. Yeah. And I'd never spade cast before. So I'm sitting there, you know, front line, <laughs> front line is rolling yeah, right, right. and I'm totally screwing up. And then it was like this total, like, you know, s- television from another era moments. Like, wait a minute, Paul, you're having trouble. Well, we happen to have Oli fixers. <laughs> he's the world spade casting champion. It's like, hello, I am Oli. I'm like, hello. And he like, then he watches me cast and he sort of looks as a sort of troubled Norse expression on his face. He goes, let me help you. And then he like hugs me. Oh, he gets that. Like, right me. And I'm like having this kind of, and I'm like grinding my ass into him. And it's like having this like homoerotic moment of working this bit. <laughs> anyway, so I don't like that kind of fishing. I'm not a, right, I, right. I can fly fish, but I don't yep. like to. What I really like and what I grew up in is fishing like on party boats out mm-hmm. of New York City and mm-hmm. Long Island, um, even though it's considered very de classe. Um, these are the guys I grew up with. And yeah. when you think about it, when you look at the genealogy of New York City and Long Island, these are the guys from like Genoa yeah. and from, well, really from, from Palermo and, and, and Sicily. These are like, these are the Sicilian families that are still fishing. Mm-hmm. And so you can knock them. But on the other hand, they have a much yeah. longer tradition than some effete yeah. guy with the fly rod. It's a great value too. Like if you're not sport fishing and you're a meat fisherman – which is a big focus of our show, yeah. um, then I think it's a great value because the cost of trying to get a boat out on the water is so shocks people when they first go offshore Absolutely. and see what it costs. So a headboat can be like a great value. And yeah. then if, you know, I fill my freezer with stuff off of a headboat, I have a boat, but I don't go offshore on it. And yeah. uh, I think they're a great value. So. Yeah, I mean, and... Um, a lot of tangles. It's a lot of tangles, but, you know, if you play the play your cards right, if you yeah. watch the reports, you can get out when yeah. it's not too full of people. And I always have interesting conversations, you know, like yeah. I remember fishing in Eastman's dock out of uh, New Hampshire and fishing next to like some garbage men from <laughs> yeah. you know from from somewhere outside yeah. Boston and I was like when do you actually have an 8 hour conversation yeah, with, a with a garbage, garbage man, man? Yeah. and it's like and I was like and I, when I realized it I said I said are you telling me you're the guy who who dumps my garbage and it's like and his friend said no Robert is the man who removes your refuse. <laughs> <laughs> That's the politically correct way. <laughs> you know, and I remember him saying, and I at the time was writing for both the Globe and for the New York Times. And he's like, he's like, so you're a writer? He's like, yeah. And he's like, what do you write for? I was like, I write for the Globe. And like, that, but it's so liberal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Doesn't strike me as that liberal. I mean, yeah. so anyway, so I like that society. Yeah. You know, my my dad. Going back to my dad, my dad would take me fishing, and what he would always do is he'd park himself in the poker game inside the cabin at the front of the boat. Right. And, okay. And uh, yeah, and I, I would go fish. outside. Right. <laughs> that, that worked out pretty well. <laughs> That's funny. And you said you grew up around Martha's Vineyard. Mm-mm. We used to go on vacation there. Um, oh, okay. I actually grew up in uh, in Greenwich, Connecticut. Oh, okay. I often, but I qualified by saying we rented, we didn't own. Yeah. All right. Thank you. <laughs> um, but. Basically, when my parents divorced, my mom was kind of like a, a communist countryside person. Okay. Like she was sure. rebelled against the system, but also loved the country. And yeah. so we, she would rent these cottages in the backwoods okay. of Greenwich and we would wander around. And that's actually the other way I found my, fell into fishing is that huge amounts, it was like ice storm uh, years of Connecticut yeah. where there were just vast depopulating estates where you could wander around okay. and poach in people's 
right. bath ponds. <laughs> so cool. I tore many a pair of jeans on barbed wire right. climbing into the Rockefeller estate. <laughs> That's my kind of guy. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about the, the fishing background, or, or I, not the fishing background, but the, the, the fish market background of, am I saying that right? The seafood background of New York City. So New York City uh, was, I mean, it's just geographically located at a perfect place for fishing. It's located at the head of the, um, the what's called the Hudson Raritan Estuary. So when people first started, com- when, when colonists first came here, the fish that they pursued were actually not all of the sort of, you know, ocean species that we now associate with Long Island, not like, you know, striped bass, bluefish, so forth. What they really focused on were the um, diadromous fish, the fish that inhabited the river. So sturgeon, mm-hmm. shad, herring, eels, those yeah. were the real money fish of New York. Um, and there's, you know, huge... Got to catch those Atlantic sturgeon. Yeah. Must be something. They were huge. And, um, you know, they're still there. I actually... I see you them know, jump out of the water from time to time. Yeah. And I was, you know, biking along the west side um, on the bike path, and I saw, you know, about an 80-pound sturgeon. Oh, right out here. Just, just yeah. yeah. So they're still here. Um, but interestingly, up until the early 90s, there was even a... There was still a commercial caviar fishery in the Hudson. Oh, wow. Um, but now they're yeah. now they're listed. Now they're yeah. endangered species. Right. Um, but, you know, so there was that. And then the other big factor of New York uh, was the oyster, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, and used to be that, um, as Mark Karlansky wrote in his book, The Big Oyster, you know, if you were from out of town and you said you were going to New York, people would say to you, oh, have a good time. Enjoy the oysters. Yeah, it's like when you say you're going to Maine, it's like, oh, enjoy the lobster. Enjoy the lobster. <laughs> Same kind of thing. Because, yeah. you know, at one time, the greater New York bite was, you know, I've heard it put out there that it was the greatest oyster fishery in the world. Wow. Um, and, you know, there are tales of... Oysters being the size of a dinner plate that you could find. I think it was Swift who said that eating an American wow. oyster was like eating a baby. <laughs> they were so big, big. And big. Man. <laughs> That'll turn you off your chow oh, right there. Oh, I don't know. I'm um, hooked me up. <laughs> but, um, but interestingly, um, you know, that oyster ecosystem also supported a whole other range of fish uh, that we wouldn't necessarily have nowadays, although they're starting to leak back in. Um, so, for example, there was a fish called the sheep's head. Um, oh yeah, which is more identified specialist as a, to eating of crustaceans. Yeah, because right? it has big People buck teeth. teeth. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And um, you know, normally we associate those with the Mid Atlantic or the Far mm-hmm. South yeah, because Florida they even. still have mm-hmm. extant oysteries. Interestingly, two months ago, this guy I fished with, Vinny Calabro, <laughs> out of Howard Beach. He's a he's sometimes he's a guard at Rikers Island. Okay. But when he's not a guard at Rikers yeah. Island, he said, you know, he's take a look at this. And he sends me this picture of a guy with a 15-pound sheep's head caught, wow. it, caught in Jamaica Bay. And actually, you know, I should say in New York, we have this bay called Sheep's Head Bay. And it was called Sheep's Head oh, Bay because okay. of Sheep's Head. Mm-hmm. Anyway, we went out fishing. I, we didn't catch them, but we did this weird thing where we pulled up to these gnarly looking metal poles and then dropped like quarters of green crabs right down the side of the pole and that's where he but they were getting like 15 pound sheep's head which maybe suggests that we're starting to get some oyster yeah uh, recolonization do they eat barnacles too they will eat barnacles and in fact one way you chum for sheep's head is to pull up to a post like that and take a big rake and scrape the bark barnacles off and gets them all excited okay i imagine too at that time they had um a lot of what are now more offshore fish for us all the ground fish for instance would have been inshore fish they were right they were and uh, if you go back and look through you know, some early fi- not even fishing reports as recently as the 1920s. I remember just finding an article. It was like, it was like a kind of article I would have written for the New England fishermen. It was like, it was like how to catch cod off the Coney Island pier. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and they're recommending like just massive tackle and you could catch codfish wow. from shore off the Coney Island pier. There were also fish, um, which you guys have up in Maine called whiting, mm-hmm. uh, which are in the hake yep. family, silver hake. Um, those were actually called frost fish in New York because um, they would, on a full moon, come in and often they'd freeze in the air and wash up on the beach. And people used to back up pickup trucks down to the beach of Coney Island, just wow. fill it up yeah. with whiting. Which, oh, wow. needless to say, we don't have those anymore. Yeah, no kidding. All right, take us through, I guess, I want to start at Four Fish okay. and get a sense of. You know, what's your big picture overview, I guess, elevator pitch on the book? And then kind of, you know, what was the journey of, of writing that like? Because I imagine knowing the, the three books, I imagine that was your personal probably confrontation with the state of the world's fisheries in the in your, uh, I guess, just research doing that book and, yeah. and talking to different people. Yeah. Well, I mean, the elevator pitch is that 
um, 100 years ago, everything, nearly everything we ate from the sea was wild. Mm -hmm. And we're just now crossing the point where more than half of that is farmed. So when you think of that, that's like an epical switch. Like we haven't yeah. had that since 10,000 years ago when right, we came the out of the- Neolithic Revolution. Yeah, right? when it's we came out the of the caves. pivotal moment in human history. Exactly. And so, you know, that happened on land and, it, we, you know, we, we write about it, we talk about it, it's, it's considered a real milepost. And here we were skating right past this moment without anyone really yeah. paying attention to say, whoa, right. the taming of the sea, is that what's really going on? And so, you know, for me, the ocean was always the last wild place. It's one of the reasons the subtitle is The Last Wild Food. It was always a place for me to kind of get out and explore the ocean. And um, the fact that there was this huge biotech sociological revolution going on to tame the ocean was really fascinating. So in a way, the book is the, is four, biography, four biographies of four, you know, kinds of fish it's not really species yeah. it's sort of what i call flesh archetypes yeah okay. but like you know so it's salmon sea bass cod and tuna yeah. and um looking at them in and out of domestication but also looking at them from the experience uh, and point of view of an angler mm -hmm. which is you know sort of how i come at it so yeah and it's a food friendly read too yeah. uh, just because it is kind of um well, I know you've probably had how many articles have you written now on like what foods, what fish to buy, and what fish to avoid? I mean, you must be asked to write these articles. <laughs> well, I, you know, time. in in the latest book, in the Omega Principle, I call that the standard article. Yeah, the standard article, exactly. <laughs> you know, so you must have written a tremendous number of these. I have, I have written them, and it's amazing that people still want the same article. It's yeah. like you know, we could just zero. But it's this. confusing to people, right? So that's the thing is, I know it's can. For me, I am able to catch the fish I eat now, uh, yeah. so I'm like removed from the dilemma, I yeah, guess, yeah. but a lot of people aren't, and and I know a lot of people who preferentially like to buy wild food, but are very confused at trying to figure out what even is a wild fish yeah. anymore, so, you know, what kind of, what are some of the conclusions that you came to in that book? Like, you know, maybe if you could just mention a little bit about each one of those flesh sure. archetypes. Yeah. <laughs> well, so the flesh archetypes, I mean, so you have salmon, which mm -hmm. is, you know, your sort of pink orangey yeah. thing that you would want to bake or maybe smoke because it has high oil content. Mm -hmm. um, and again, we, you know, most people who don't uh, have a sort of facile understanding of the sea or who don't, most people who don't have a, a, a working knowledge of the sea, they just think salmon. But in fact, you know, there's Atlantic salmon on the Atlantic coast and then there's five different species mm -hmm. on our Pacific coast. So there's that. The next one I do is sea bass, which is, you know, uh, sort of a more substantial white fish that you would want but to But isn't that kind of like a generic label for fish of that flesh yes. type, isn't yes, it? Yes, it's like yes. a marketing term. Kind yeah, of so, you know, so I chose the word sea bass because there are actually eight different taxonomic families that have fish in them. That are called, called that. That are it's called bass. different families of fish. Yeah, and when I, when I do public talks about it, the slide I use, you know, I show a slide of Chilean sea bass, American striped bass, um, and then European sea bass, yeah. you know, and show them all as... You know, and then I show the next slide that, that they're basically as similar to one another taxonomically. And then I have a slide of me of um, uh, my son Luke, and then a ring-tailed lemur. Right, right, like, right. They're yeah. basically kind you of know, same they have shape binocular vision. You know, they probably taste <laughs> the lamps, same. Right. You know? Yeah. Um, so, so the sea bass chapter ends up being ab about really some to some degrees. It's 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 like a linguistical thing. Where do we get this word bass from? Mm -hmm. But then it's also about the next step in domestication because so salmon were relatively easy to domesticate because they came out of these big nutrient-rich eggs, which allow the fish to transition to um, industrial feed very mm -hmm. easily because they live off of that big yolk sac. Yeah. Sea bass and all these other what are called persiforms don't have that yolk sac, or it's, if they do, it's very small. And so you have to feed them live feed. So yeah. to some degree, that chapter is about the sort of biotech revolution that had to be figured out in order right. to bring those to market. Um, and then I do cod, and cod is really like, I think the subheading of that book of that chapter is um, the return of the commoner. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of about how codfish really were one of the fish, one of the f creatures upon which we built the industrial revolution. Yeah. They fed all sorts of, they fed slaves in the American South. They fed industrial workers in England and so forth. Um, and then, but now, you know, we've overfished cod in a lot of its range. Um, and so we've come up with these alternate, what are called white fish, um, tilapia, and and Pangasius catfish. I just can't the just the name tilapia. I'm so repulsed. I don't. <laughs> I can't honestly say that I know what tilapia tastes like. I just always cr something about the name makes me cringe, and the idea of it. And I picture it being grown in like swimming pools. Or well, something. you know, you're not too far off. I mean, yeah. it is grown in ponds, and um, it's funny. T tilapia is many times you'll have a fish 
where it's not working out market wise, and so they monkey around with the name, like you know, Patagonian toothfish became Chilean sea bass. So much better. I mean, <laughs> imagine that so, Patagonian toothfish yeah, on the menu. You're the like, or the Chilean yeah, sea bass. You're like, yeah. I'll go with the sea bass. <laughs> yeah. And it was so that was such a hip name. It, you know, the thing, one of the things that made Chilean sea bass really take off. There's one line in Jurassic Park where uh, this um, the Hammond, Doctor Hammond. Um, just has just shown a velociraptor like rip a cow to shreds and then he says um i believe our chef has prepared a meal for us a chilean sea bass i think <laughs> and that one moment before up until then it had been primarily a west coast fish and that really made it that really did yeah people okay. talk about it. i mean you know it's hard yeah. to say i mean yeah, yeah, it, yeah, yeah but but that's what's the, no kidding anyway um but tilapia is one of those rare fish that actually came onto the market with its name, and it kept its name. Yeah, you know, it's like people. That's it's not a pleasant sounding is tilapia name. Tilapia is strictly a farmed fish. Pretty much. I mean, you. I mean, unless you're like fishing in the Nile or something. Um, but there are many. It's a cichlid, and there are many species of cichlid. But there are two main species: the Nile and the Mozambique um, t- uh, tilapia. Um, you know, it's funny. One our aquaculture guy I know. When he first heard the word tilapia, he thought it was a stomach disease. Mm-hmm. That's um, what I'm saying. It just has this sound like it's not something not good. Yeah. But, you know, it's, I mean, it's the f- fifth or sixth most consumed fish yeah. in America. Yeah. So, yeah. you know. And I don't mean, I mean, I'm being critical because I, I have the, the luxury of freezer full of fish I've caught. But, yeah, like, yeah. you know, I understand, like, it's a well, it's a solution to a lot of issues, or at least can be. In the, in the codfish chapter, I go into a discussion of why it is we might have certain perceptions of some of these cheaper farmed fish like tilapia, like pangasios. But one of the main reasons is there um, there is a term in the fish farming industry called off flavor. Mm-hmm. And it's 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 caused when you have a certain kind of algal bloom in a pond. And it's a compound called geosmin from the Greek geo, meaning earth. So if you've ever had an earthy or muddy tasting fish, it's because that fish yeah. was in a pond with a bad algal bloom. I, I'd like to hit on this for a second. With because the lake trout? Yeah, up in Maine where we are, and as I said, somebody learn, <laughs> learning to fish as an adult has been. <laughs> Luckily, I have, I'm like old enough to know my learning process. Yeah. So I've been able to execute that learning process and find a lot of mentors along the way. Yeah. But most of them are folks who, um, I don't know how, to, how do you put it nicely, just kind of redneck type characters. <laughs> um, really great people, but not um, often super educated people or not very sophisticated thinkers, but really like uh, mechanically and technically very talented yes, people. Yes, you know? yes, and, um, and they've, they don't necessarily mentor, you got to like draw it out of them. That's right. And they have a lot of judgments about different species that coming to it fresh, I don't, it's like things that are like, oh, I would never eat that. And coming to it fresh, you're like, well, it tastes really good to me, you know? Yeah. And one of them for us was lake trout, which they all call mud hens. Oh, yeah. Because um, they're and down they're down. I deep. guess, but they always say they taste like mud. And and I've eaten so many that are d- just delicious. But I think that as I've – and there's a few other fish that I hear that about, oh, they taste muddy, they taste muddy, they taste muddy. And now I'm thinking that, like, they had a bad experience – you know, related to what you're sure, talking about. Sure, I'm sure they did. I mean, you know, there's a commercial lake trout fishery on the Great Lakes. It's mm-hmm. a highly coveted fish. Sure. And when the Great Lakes lost their lake trout to lamprey invasion, I mean, that was a big deal because yeah. it was very valuable fish. So that's yeah. absurd. But, you know, I've written about this in the past. Actually, my very first kind of think piece on fish was for the Boston Globe. And it was called A Tale of Two Fish. And it was about bluefish and striped bass, both of which you've probably encountered. Mm-hmm. And it was sort of about why it is that we consider – Striped bass is sort of noble, right. you know, right. grandiose fish. And then the bluefish is this, you know, ratty interfering thing. And it goes all the way back to Isaac Walton um, in, you know, I don't know if you've come across, there's a famous book called The Complete Angler. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And so, you know, Walton wrote that book. Some say it's an allegory um, and that each of the fish in the book are actually referent to something going on in English politics oh, at the time. Oh, political stuff. Yeah, sure. And, um, you know, it was right after the... Um, Charles II had been decapitated. Okay. And um, so he, Walton says um, that the the salmon is considered to be the king of fish, whereas the pike or loose um, is the tyrant. And people, same pike we have here, the northern yes, pike. Yes, same pike. Um, and in the in the you know people who study Walton think that the salmon was basically Charles II. And the pike was Cromwell. Okay, interesting. All right, with the teeth. Yeah, that's fascinating. Anyway, so you know, there's always, and you know, I think um, 
So he said something about bluefish. Oh well, so I no, he didn't. He didn't even know okay, about bluefish. Gotcha. But so I just saying like I always loved bluefish, right? And and there are people like on Martha's Vineyard, which is where I reported the article. Who you know, real vineyarders, you know, old school vineyarders. There's one guy Everett Poole, who's this fishmonger there. He's like, he says striped bass is the least flavorsome fish in the ocean, and bluefish is the most flavorsome. <laughs> I love that because how I always hear it is it's oily, yeah. it's oily, it's well, too oily. And, and weirdly, you know, I was just... <laughs> who are you talking to that says that about? Every, I don't know. I'm just so sick of hearing about how mackerel and bluefish yeah, are know, oily. Know. You know? Well, it mostly, you know, I interesting. So I was just in Italy doing a TED talk, and one of the people, other t- TED talkers, was a woman from Istanbul, and um, big famous sort of locavore chef who knew. But so bluefish are are all over the world, and. Um, they're the bluefish of um, the straits around Istanbul are like nationally famous, like considered the most prized and delicious mm-hmm. fish, so like all over Turkey. And uh, you know, and and when I told her that it was like you know you can get it for like eighty nine cents yeah. a pound to you know? trash fish, she, they yeah, say, yeah. Right? She was like, "What? Yeah, it's um, so interesting how you have these different pockets of yeah. ideas about about different species." I think what I said in the Tale of Two Fish article is that you know the argument for one fish being better than the other is specifically incorrect and generally in- ridicu- <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, but you know, fish um, fish gain their reputations by whom they with whom they associate. Mm-hmm. So you know. For example, when we still had viable amounts of Atlantic salmon in northeastern rivers, it was the striped bass that was the nuisance yep. because they would often mm-hmm. pass each other. And right. um, and it was a collapsed nobleman, nobleman um, named Frank Forster who wrote like a, basically a pan to the striped bass and lifted it up. And then, oh, wow. and then Daniel Webster went fishing for striped bass. Okay. And so once – Fish get their advocates, then they kind of sublimate, unbeknownst to fish. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, they're just yeah. duking it yeah, out, you know? <laughs> oh, but that striped bass is a cult following. It has totally. a cult following. And right? you know what? I have to say, so I, I went striped bass fishing not too long ago uh, in Jamaica Bay and with my guy, Vinny Calabro. And Vinny. Vinny's, Vinny always is like throwing fish at me afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> take it home, take it home, I can eat it all. So I was just like, you know, and, and we were on our f- like fourth meal of striped bass this month. We've already had our children, so yeah. I was going to say that's, <laughs> that's one you got to be careful. Yeah, with, right? um, and it was like, and I was turned to my partner. I was like, just kind of like not taste that good to you. She's like, yeah, I don't really like this striped bass. And I was like, yeah, I kind of agree with you. Yeah. And I kind of would like prefer a fresh bluefish at yes. this point. Yes, and I mean, we'll get to your your most recent book, but I mean, the the oil in it is. Yes. I mean, you can look at that as oily, or you can look at it as like nutrition, right? Because yes. it's really good nutrition, but. Yep. Well, th- I mean, the reason bluefish go off is that they have um, they have a compound in the flesh that goes off very, very quickly. Mm-hmm. And there are actually a few fish, f- very few fish that have this, but they actually have a separate HACCP, uh, um, you know, regulatory pathway because they have oh, wow. this this specific compound, which whose name is escaping yep. me at the moment, but okay. you can look it up later. Got you. So you were, and then you you said striped bass, and um, I think the one chapter left to tuna. discuss would be the tuna. Yeah. yeah so so tuna, you know, that was. Um, that's the sushi fish. Mm-hmm. Um, and I first became aware that there was weird sushi, sushification of the world was happening when I was I was working in Moscow. And I remember seeing four sushi shops on Tverskoy Boulevard, you know, like what, right. what is sushi doing in right. Moscow? So that that is really the story of the globalization of fishing and of the expansion of fishing. You know, many tuna are caught in what are called the high seas. Yeah. Uh, which is um, unregulated, unregulated waters, right? Basically, you know, international waters. International waters outside of national jurisdiction. So a lot of tuna come from there. And fishing in, in international waters has risen by 800% um, in the last, I think, 50 years. So that story is really about, about you know, the the final frontier of fishing yeah. is going out. To the, and, and also it's about, you know, what's wildlife and what's food. And when you look at, there are, you know, many attempts out there now to domesticate bluefin tuna, but- you know, fish that swims at forty miles an hour. Yeah. That's warm blooded. It has all of the things that that grows to. I mean, what's the what the max size? You know, of twelve hundred pounds. You know, My but um, but you know, it just harpoon them up in Maine where we are. Yeah, yeah. I mean, metabolically, they just aren't the right fish for domestication. Yeah. But because we can, we're trying. And so, I guess the end of that end of four fish be is is like I don't really come out against aquaculture. I mean, I know yeah. you're you know. Like a committed wild guy. No, yeah, but I'm, I'm not. I'm. That's not a stance I'm taking. It's just. Uh, 
from for like what I want to eat, I'm a pretty pretentious about it. I'd say, right. but but you know, I mean, I I am curious also. Like, what year did you write that book in? So that came out in 2010. Okay, a lot's happened in the with tuna. Yeah. Um, specifically, I don't want to digress too much, but you know where you're at now, I guess, what were your conclusions then? And then what do you feel now? And, and, and I guess I just also want to say, I don't know that people realize the impact that sushi has had yeah, on sure. fisheries. I mean, it's just incredible. Yeah. And I, I'm really guilty of ordering bluefin when I go to a sushi restaurant. Yeah. It's I so mean, good. it's like so damn good. <laughs> yeah. You know? <laughs> well, I mean. Maybe some of that tuna belly. <laughs> so, I mean, the, there are actually, there's been bad and good that's happened with tuna since writing the book. Um, they, the good news was that they did actually uh, put in place pretty good regulatory action in the Mediterranean. And what a lot of your listeners probably don't realize is that tuna cross the Atlantic. And so you have a, a population that spawns um, in the Gulf of Mexico and you have a population that spawns um, in the Eastern Mediterranean, but they'll actually mix up off of North Carolina. I've been there when they're they're there. And so, do they know if fish actually at switch? Or are they dedicated to breeding in those two? Like they 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 home one, one the, from Mediterranean is always going yeah. back to the Mediterranean. Plus, the Mediterranean ones have an outrageous accent. No, I mean <laughs> I can't even you understand can each other. <laughs> I'm going back. I'm tired of this America. They get just slaughter going through into the Mediterranean, right? They got to yeah. come through that strait. Well, and they just get ripped there, apart. There's all these traditions in various straits. All all over Europe, um, I think it's called Matanza. Yeah, yeah, that's in, it. In, yeah. in Italy, but it's called something else in in Spain. But yeah, this tradition it's of something to watch of wow. running these fish into these sort of labyrinths of ma- mm-hmm. of nets. So you know that wow. of course speaks to a different level of abundance. And mm-hmm. right now, when, with bluefin, we're looking at depending on the stock, depending on there are three species of bluefin actually, but you're looking at you know historical levels that being below ten percent of historical abundance. Wow. So yeah, so um, and and. So that's those are the sushi tunas, but then there's this whole canning tunas thing, mm-hmm. where you know much smaller tunas go into cans. Um, usually, uh, we're talking about longfin albacore, um, but also um, skipjack and a bunch of other different little tunas, and those now seem to be maxing. They can blackfins, uh, if they end up in the purse seine, yeah, okay, um, gotcha. but they don't target they them don't target per them. se. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really these smaller fish that are the ones that are. It's really skipjack. Um, that's the bread and butter of okay. the, of the canned tuna industry. But even those, you know, these cheap tunas were starting to hit the limits of sustainability on them. And um, that's the fight that's going on right now. Mm-hmm. It's like we've already heard the reports of – I think the public kind of gets it with bluefin at this point. I think people kind of know that um, that these are fish that have been hit really hard. But the canned tuna somehow seems to escape them. Yeah. Um, I think I always like to point out, and going back to our four fish, but – you know, one of the best things you can do, I think, as a consumer for yourself and for the planet is to switch from canned tuna to canned salmon. Yep. Because, okay. you know, canned salmon, it's all wild. It's coming from uh, Alaska, which is very, usually from Alaska, very well-managed fisheries. Um, canned salmon has a fraction of the mercury, it, if it has any mercury at all, mm-hmm. of canned tuna. Um, it's, you know, the great thing about salmon is that they come back to the river that yeah. they were spawned in. So you can get very, um, accurate assessments of what mm-hmm. the stock size is year after year. It's fantastic canned fish too. Yeah. yeah. It's very good. It's very good. You know, it's, it, you know, it so, some, some people, you know, think, oh, it tastes like cat food. But I got to tell you, I think the first person who opened a can of tuna said it's, it yeah, of course. Like cat food. Yeah. You know, it's classic. oily. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's and and it's just we become a yeah. you know we dunk it in enough mayonnaise and yeah, and we're done. yeah right. but uh but uh but yeah so I think um that's a great thing and also um the canned salmon, particularly sockeye, is higher in omega threes yeah than uh than canned tuna yeah. so it's a good choice it's like a no brainer it's a little it's a few more cents per can but I think especially if you have small kids and you want to like imprint them on a on a tuna sandwich why not imprint them on a Salmon, salmon sandwich. sandwich. Are you optimistic or pessimistic about where it's headed for with bluefin? Mm, well, the Atlantic bluefin, I think, stands a pretty reasonable chance right now. The Pacific bluefin is really getting hammered um, in Japan, in particular. You know, mm-hmm. where they're, they're basically selling juveniles a lot of times. Okay. Um, if you go to well, Skiji is no more, but if you had gone to Skiji Market, you would see a lot of little tuna. Um, the problem with all tunas is that they're highly migratory. And so you have to have multiple nations agree on yeah. something. And we see where that's led to when things like climate change. Yeah. On the other hand, we did fix that ozone hole 
Yeah. And that was largely through international agreement. So, and the whaling it, situation is maybe <clears throat> instructive too. Well, but that you know, but and I do use that comparison a bit. But you know, it took a moratorium yeah. to uh, start to yeah. rebuild. You know, whale population, which is like largely intact. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're, no, we're not going to hunt a whale till season seven. We've decided so. <laughs> we go to Norway for minkies. But. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So anyway, so I do think that. The future of tuna depends on the future of international yeah. relationships, mm-hmm. and if those can be bolstered and encouraged and brought down, brought along on environmental lines, great. But mm-hmm. if they can't, then um, there is no hope. As a conclusion to th- well, I'll let you conclude sort of that book. But um, a question I ask people who have an interest or are involved in fisheries often is like, if you have a magic button and you can push it, and commercial fishing goes away, the way um, the market sale of meat, meat hunting, uh, market right. hunting went away. Would you do that? In other words, there's recreational fishing, but no longer commercial fishing. Or do you think we should be looking at managing commercial fishing in such a way that it remains sustainable? And I'll, I'll add one little caveat to that too. I, I, when I spoke to Bob Stenick, mm-hmm. he said, he kind of laughed at the question because he said, I don't think you like understand how productive the ocean is compared to land. Like it's massively productive and and land can't really do what it can do, Um, which is an interesting perspective. But, you know, when you look at it, what do you, what do you see? Well, it's funny. It's a good transition into the next book and to American catch, because it was exactly this question I asked myself, having written a whole book about the rise of aquaculture and its relative merits um, and the relatively hard to control nature of Mm -hmm. fishing um, but then I was, you know, slap in the face looking at all these commercial fishermen in America who had a very different perspective. And so I have kind of come around to the idea that well-managed commercial fisheries can actually be a layer of protection for the ocean because mm-hmm. the, basically what you're doing is you're installing advocates yeah. for a clean, healthy environment that fight for it or could be empowered to fight for it if they – Mm-hmm. You know, could see past the prow of their ship a bit, and right, some right. fishermen can, mm-hmm. but many don't. Um, but there's a new generation coming up now too. One would a little hope. more ecologically aware. Yeah, I think. yeah. I mean, it's there. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> no, I don't really think no, so. No, <laughs> I, I, no, I don't doubt that a younger generation is more ecologically aware. My hesitancy is the degree. It's not like land food, where you know. Like, you know, they have the Intervale Center in Vermont where you can train to be, a, mm-hmm. you know, an organic farmer. Da, da, okay, da. Right. It's really hard to, as a young person to mm-hmm. buy into fishing. It's very expensive um, to buy the licenses. It used to be, you know, you just needed your dad's boat. Yeah, licensing boats. I mean, all of it. It's it's really adds up. So if I have pessimism about the future of fishing, it's because I don't see a viable way to grow a next generation of fishermen Especially since you know previous generations grew up with relative abundance, mm-hmm. so you know how do you how do you nurture? You know the only right. place I've really seen it happening is Maine, actually, to tell you the truth, with, with the, our lobster, with the fishing. lobster fishery, yeah. where there really is. Year and now after they're working year. in that um, the kelp aquaculture as well, so they're yeah. giving another job to these lobstermen. Sure, and-, and and also I think you know in in Maine, I believe they limit the number of pots that you can have, right? And, oh, it's and, so regulated, and, yeah. and 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 I think you know there's no absentee boat ownership, so you know. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so owner operator is the model that they at least that they're wanting. To, yeah, and so uh, that you know, there's a possibility there. Anyway, um, so I think that um, fishing well regulated. I mean, also from a carbon perspective. I mean, this is an unpopular position. So you know, when I delved into the question of is fishing good, you know, like from an American perspective, mm-hmm. the name that comes up a lot is a guy named Ray, Ray Hilborn at the University of, Washington, University of Washington. And in the conservation community, he's often demonized because he's considered to be, you know, some say that he's, you know, sponsored by industry and so his science is questionable. But there's one point of Hillborn's that I think is worth noting, which is that the carbon impact of fishing can be much lighter than farming. And mm-hmm. if you had to replace all the fish that you were catching with farmed product, you know, you have to till the soil, you have to make fertilizer, you have to run your tractors, all this kinds of things that ends up to be a very carbon intensive thing. So <clears throat> things like anchovies um, that you can catch with a midwater trawl, which has very little drag on the engine and, you know, really a very carbon light way of bringing food to market. So that's another reason. So anyway, so all of this, these, this kind of thinking led me to write the next book, 
American Catch. That book rocked my world. Oh, thank you. I'm glad I you liked it. I was deeply struck by it. In the beginning of the book, you and a theme throughout the book is how much of the American Catch is being eaten by Americans. I don't remember the numbers exactly, so I'll let you kind of – Well, yeah. I mean, share. the whole the, – the thing, the real whopper, you know, you always like – you know, when you set out to write a book versus an article – you really need like a very big architecture, a big question, a big central question. So if the central question in Four Fish was, you know, 100 years ago, everything was farmed, was wild, and now half of it is farmed. That's the that's a big question. Mm-hmm. In this one, the big, the big toggle point was the United States controls more ocean than any country on earth, and yet 90% of our seafood is imported. Oh, my goodness. Which is just – it's 90%. 90%. You know, and it varies. You know, it depends on how you – run the trade numbers and but that's I don't really, acclimate to that ever it's just <laughs> always striking it's really really striking and so delving into that question was really what I wanted to do with that book and you know there were many answers to it I mean not only are we just you know to some degree um, just a client state to places like China um, and even North Korea produces more farm seafood than we do um, but but we're we're bringing all this farm seafood. Mostly North Korea farmed. produces more farmed seafood than, than the United States. What's you, the export like then? If that's the import, well, so this is where it gets tricky. So, you know, ninety percent of our seafood that we eat is imported, but we actually export. We Americans export about a third of what we can. say it's not like we're not fishing. No, we're fishing plenty, um, but we're sending about a third of it abroad. Often fish that would be really good for us, like things like mackerel. A lot of mackerel goes abroad. Um, a lot of the lobsters, it's oily. <laughs> but a lot of lobster goes abroad. Yeah. A lot of black cod in the Pacific coast. I think goes we were abroad. talking about shrimp in the south too. Right? Um, to some degree, shrimp shrimp will go abroad, but shrimp is more of an import thing because you know we eat more shrimp than any oh, okay. seafood. We, we right. eat four pounds of seafood per person per year. That's right, yeah. Total seafood consumption is like fourteen, fifteen. That surprised year. me too. In the book, you talk about how is is it fair to say that. For the average American, they eat more shrimp than any other seafood. Is oh, that, yeah. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, they Because eat... I didn't grow up like that. Like, oh, really? I grew up eating fish, and I, I grew up eating lobster. Yeah. But we didn't eat a lot of shrimp, and so when I read that, I was, like, kind of surprised by yeah. it. Hey, we'll get right back to the show, but I wanted to take a moment to tell you how you can see Season 1 of Wild Fed. If you head over to wild-fed.com right now, you'll see that pre-orders for Season 1 are available alongside the Season 1 experience. Both will begin on January 6th of 2020. If you choose the show on its own, you'll get access to a new episode every week for eight weeks. Remember, these are 30-minute episodes, not the 22 minutes of a typical TV show. If you choose the program, it'll include season one, but each week, along with a new episode, you'll receive a director's cut, where our producer Grant Giuliano and I break down the episode, discussing the background, the gear we use, the places and people and stories involved, as well as some of the comedy that took place on the side, some of the drama, some of the intrigue that we couldn't squeeze into the 30-minute format. You'll also get exclusive access to a weekly live Q&A where we'll be answering your questions and discussing how you can get started hunting, fishing, and foraging for food. Additionally, this will all take place inside of a private member group where you'll have access to me and the Wild Fed team for a full nine weeks, as well as a community of like-minded folks. If you just want to see the show on its own, it's 49 bucks. If you want to join me in the nine-week program, that's just 249 bucks. Go over to wild-fed.com to get the show or sign up for the program. Now, here's the rest of the podcast. And that's a relatively recent phenomenon, but, you know, we, we eat about four pounds of shrimp, and that's about equivalent to the next two most consumed uh, combined, so salmon and tuna. Okay. Uh, we eat a couple of pounds of each I of those. I eat four pounds of shrimp tonight if <laughs> put it in front of it. <laughs> yeah, so, well, all of this makes you hungry, right? Um, but, yeah, and um, so so the, the, the book was really this kind of weird exploration of how did this imbalance happen, and I... You know, four fish is told in four parts. This one is told in three parts. Um, so I do American oysters, um, shrimp, and then um, salmon in Bristol Bay. Um, and in each case, it's sort of like a different cautionary tale. You know, in one case, it's destruction of estuary environment. You know, we as a nation have lost about 70% of our salt marsh since colonization. I would think a lot of people who live on estuary salt marshes don't even know that they do. I mean, like, I'm if you, sure they wouldn't they even know that. I'm sure they just think of it as this stinky, worthless mm-hmm. part of the property. Smells like eggs. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Slow died. But, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, and you know, we, I mean, we're, 
literally sitting on landfill right here. I mean, we're a little mm-hmm. upstream. From, I mean, up uphill from the from the landfill. But you know, New York is a Manhattan is a I think a fifth or a sixth again as big as it was because we've filled, filled in, in the marsh that was around it. My goodness! So that's usually the what most we productive do. Productive land, right? Yeah, or, and I mean, and you know more productive than tropical rainforests as far as sequestering carbon. Wow! Um, so it's just super, super, and also you know s- you know something like seventy percent of coastal seafood needs a salt marsh for propagation mm-hmm. for nursery habitat okay, and right. so forth and sometimes actual spawning so by li- we're literally cutting our nose off to spite our face when it comes to seafood mm-hmm. so that's a big part of it and oysters are part of that and shrimp are a part of it too because um shrimp rely shrimp actually sp- um spawn um uh, i'm trying to remember what the order well it depends on the shrimp but shrimp nevertheless they use um inshore uh, salt marsh as as rearing habitat, and it's really key. And you lose that, you lose right. your shrimp. Okay. So, which under, makes sense that now so much of our shrimp is coming to us from abroad. Mm-hmm. You know, farms mostly in China and Vietnam and Thailand. Yeah. Which, as we then learned, was we're actually being um, employing slave labor. Sure. Uh, to bring those shrimp to market. So. And so, I imagine farming with practices that would be considered somewhat questionable here. I'm remembering, actually, you talking about. Uh, it's not fresh in my mind. I, I don't think I can quote it, but I remember you talking about some of the practices over there. Maybe was it with mangrove? Yeah. So mangrove forests um, are natural shrimp rearing habitat because you know if you look at the way mangroves grow, they literally their roots are like fingers yeah, that go into the mud, mm-hmm. and that holds the holds the sediment in place. And also, there's lots of nooks and crannies for hiding, so it's really perfect. Um, habitat for for juvenile shrimp and many sort of artisan fisheries uh in like bangladesh and so forth depend on mangroves to rear the shrimp that they're that and the other fish that they're harvesting but shrimp ponds tend to be put right where those mangrove forests were so we've lost millions of acres of mangrove forest over the course of the last 50 years a lot of it to shrimp farming um and you know, and and it's particularly industrial shrimp farming because what happened was you would have these diseases that bacterial infections that would arise in shrimp farms. And so they would abandon the ponds and then dig another pond mm. and then dig another one, another one, another one. And that kind of that process has slowed down a bit. And you know, there's there's these systems called bioflock systems, which you know treat the water and da da da. But still, nevertheless, you know, there's still a lot of ponds sitting with where there should be mm-hmm. mangrove forest. And it's also, in effect, a privatization of the commons. You know, you have all these yeah. sort of, you know, indi- yeah, exactly. indigenous artisan pe- fishermen mm-hmm. who relied on that wealth to, yeah. to, you know, and now it's, you know, in the for- in, in the possession of multinationals growing right. shrimp for Western consumption, largely. And it's, it's easy for me to just, like, throw a question out there, like, hey, if you could push a button, that would end commercial fishing. But then that brings up, obviously, aquaculture, and then both things have what's good about them and what's bad about them. Yeah. Um, but it's not like a thing where people are going to stop eating seafood or fish, um, which asks, begs the question, like, well, why do we need to eat fish? Mm-hmm. Which kind of brings me to the Omega principle. Right. Because if you would ask me, like, what, you know, why do we need fish? Like, that would be one of the reasons I would answer is that we have a lipid imbalance and that mm-hmm. we, we are Omega-6 dominant and we need these Omega-3s. Your book was – so balanced in the way that the information was laid out that I realized like, okay, I might have bought into too much hype around this. <laughs> and I was fascinated by also the question of, is it the same thing, you know, to take fish oil as it is to eat a fish? So yeah. can you tell us about, this is your most recent book, you yeah. know, like what, what did you, what, tell us about sort of start to finish, like what the story of this book is. Yeah. Well, so, you know, the, the, the Omega Principle is the third in the Marine Trilogy. You know, this is the one that really got Hollywood's attention. <laughs> what did you call it? The-, <laughs> <laughs> the Game of Thrones of Fish. <laughs> the Game of Thrones of Fish. This is one where I don't even know the names of it. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> with sardines. The, the sardines. That's right. Sardines are coming. (laughs) Um, No, you know, it was one of these things. So I started, I started the Marine Trilogy when I was, you know, in my late thirties and this one I tucked into in my late forties. And so all of the sort of middle age things that affect you, a person were starting to affect me, you know, the joints and the heart rate and the cholesterol and the blood pressure. My pressure was getting high. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> they say, my, my pressure, <laughs> and, um, 
And, you know, so I don't like going to doctors and, um, you know, I generally try to correct things naturally. And when I would Google very, this problem, that problem, whatever. All of them, right? <laughs> always the Omega-3 came up. Yeah. And, you know, then there was like, the, then I was like, then I reverse engineered the, the Google search. I was like, I put in, I typed into the search engine, Omega-3s may, Omega-3s <laughs> might. And I get this such a funny readout, you know, like might cure Lou Gehrig's disease, might um, build muscle tissue in older adults. And then my favorite one, might boost sperm competitiveness mm. and, 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 and Fiery. you know so when, when, when i was on tour this summer and i would just sort of like spin that out really quickly and and then move on to the next part of the talk and then somebody asked me sorry to interrupt why would i want my sperm to be more competitive <laughs> and like you, know, you ask a guy that like well of course i want it to outrace yeah. all the other sperm yeah. i don't want any other sperm getting in there <laughs> I don't know who I'm competing with here, but <laughs> but get out of the way! <laughs> High omega three sperm coming through. <laughs> um, anyway, so um, but then you know I realized also that there was this part of the story of the ocean that I wanted to tell beyond fishing, which was the you know you can talk till you're blue in the face about this fish is overfished or you know these. You know, those quotas are too high, blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, it's really kind of moving checkers around on a board. Mm -hmm. And that's like if there's a lot more, a lot less red guys, there's going to be more black guys mm -hmm. and back and forth. Da, da, da. And the fish, you know, you remove fish from an ecosystem through fishing. The ecosystem tends to kind of rebalance itself. And then you just get more of this other stuff and whatever. But the fundamental stuff that actually is where the omega-3 is invented. Because remember, omega-3s are not invented by fish. They are, mm -hmm. it's plankton, yep. phytoplankton. Yep. That, that bioaccumulate up the food web. That bio, just like mercury, right? So when you start messing with the planktonic level of the yeah. ocean, okay. that's when you're starting to really worry about the future of everything. And it makes fishing just seem like a little pimple right. on, on okay. this giant face of the ocean that could just implode into itself yeah so yeah so and i so i in a way um i don't want to i don't want to undersell the book and say it's just all about plankton <laughs> <laughs> I, I will tell you there's only one chapter that's specifically about plankton um but it but that theme emerges but throughout. theme emerges you know i mean so the the interesting thing is that the omega-3 was actually invented as a defense against climate change mm -hmm. so that um m microalgae invented phyto uh, invented um, omega-3s because they make your membranes more supple. And see, as uh, algae removed uh, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, the, 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 the planet got uh, cooler and cooler So because there wasn't that insulation level. It's called the great oxygenation event. Mm -hmm. And so in order to migrate to colder water, they had to develop this compound. The funny sort of backstory, like complete circle of that whole thing is that Interestingly, now what we're doing, we humans are doing, is we're taking up all that petroleum. And what is petroleum? It's just fossilized mm -hmm. microalgae. And we're burning it, and we're putting carbon back into the atmosphere, which is exactly the atmosphere that those very first microorganisms yeah. liked. So, you know, I say, I'm a, I love a good conspiracy theater, theory. What if it's not humans who are to blame for climate change? What if we're just part of yeah. a giant Ponds algae, a al algae <laughs> conspiracy? And we're just, you said the first chapter of the book is called Algae's Tools, but it's a double entendre yeah. because it's like, what are omega's, what are algae's tools? Well, omega-3s are algae's tools, but what are humans? Yeah. Algae's, algae's tools. tools. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. Podcasters, light up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Podcast listeners, light up in time. <laughs> time to sit back and enjoy algae conspiracy. Anyway. <laughs> but anyway, I mean, it, but that's sort of the initial part of the book. But, you know, the book, the more serious parts of the book are really like this giant supplement industry which i'm sorry to say i'm i'm sitting across from no a, no worries oh no i'm not guy. that kind i'm not in that part of the supplement industry no i'm a little tamer but yeah um, I, I but get you know that there's this you know multi-billion dollar supplement industry mm -hmm. that has risen um largely on the basis of some science but also tons know, of hype tons of hype and i don't know if you saw it but just recently just five days ago a huge omega-3 study came out, probably the biggest one ever, called the Vital Study out of Brigham and Women's Hospital. And it was vitamin D and omega-3s looking at cancer and cardiovascular health. Vitamin D, bup, nothing. bupkas. Nothing. 
pretty much nothing. Wow. Um, omega threes, nothing for cancer. So cross that one. Omega threes. Treatment or prevention or both? They're looking at prevention. Yeah. Prevention because this was one of the first huge trials of okay. healthy people. Mm -hmm. Like in the past, oh, omega threes right. have been used for people who've already had a, right. a an event. An event. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You'll call it a procedure. <laughs> yes, right, no, no, you have an event and then you get a procedure. <laughs> By the way, did you know that half of all patients first report heart disease to their doctors by dropping dead? Wow. It's like it's just this weird thing, which is like, so that's one of the, there's, so, I mean, I'm not a doctor, um, and I, but I had to delve into this medical literature. And um, it turns out, like, when you talk about cardiovascular disease and you talk about outcomes, <laughs> death, <Right. laughs> um, there are, or it can be just different. So when they talk about cardiovascular disease, it's often they look at like six or seven different aspects of cardiovascular disease. So stroke, heart attack, um, sudden death, sudden cardiac death, um, and then I think there's arterial sclerosis. But sudden death, sudden cardiac death, SCD, is one of those factors that they've seen even in these null finding studies, they've shown a little bit of an effect of omega threes that suddenly go like this. Ah, oh, it's the yeah. big one. That that you could decrease Just that, that little bit of membrane permeability. <laughs> right. So, um, so anyway, so anyway, going back to this vital study that just came out, they found um, overall um, that they didn't see significant effect for the whole host of cardiovascular diseases. They did see a twenty eight percent reduction in heart attack. But oh, wow. keep in mind, but that's just one of the family yeah. of cardiovascular disease. So I think when they it's 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 really like schizophrenic right now. Like if you Google vital study and look at the news headlines, mm -hmm. you literally have one one headline that says twenty eight percent reduction in heart attack by omega threes, right. and then you'll have another headline that says no effect, no effect. on cardiovascular disease from from, from omega three. In the book, you go to like an omega <laughs> event, right? I do. Well, I, so I went. It's to a the, very funny chapter. Thank you. I'm glad you liked it. Um, it was a bitch to write, but um, yeah. I, so there's this organization called the Global Organization for EPA and DHA Omega Threes, and they had their annual conference in the Canary Islands at the Ritz Carlton. Mm -hmm. So it gives you an idea that there's money in yeah, this. Yeah, um, this Omega thing. So I went to this this conference and it was really, um, it was a funny, funny event because it was, you know, there, was, there were physicians, but there were also these people. So there'd been all these null findings coming out. And so there was this like kind of sort of soul searching yeah. going on. And I remember they had this, they had actually invited me to speak at the conference and were and offered me oh. quite a bit of money and I turned it just so when I sold the book there were headlines in the press and stuff and I was a pew fellow and so lots of people were like um, took notice that I was doing this and so the global organization for EPA and yeah. DHA omega threes offered me like five figures to go to the Canary Islands and do the talk. And and talk to them. Yeah, it was said, like this conflict. I was like, respectfully, I sh I declined. Yeah, so I had to decline, um, which is not easy given that I have yeah. a family and stuff right, like that. Right, you know, right. not very. You know, it takes years to write a book, but you give it an hour and get five figures. That's yeah. pretty good. Yeah. So I declined it, but I just but I wrote them. I said, but could I could I come anyway? So I went, and I'm so glad I declined um, because I mean, actually, I think it's an interesting organization. It's not like corrupt. Or you anything. actually describe in the book like, wow, I'm, I kind of like these people more than I thought yeah. I was going to. <laughs> well, the thing is, like, I, I I kind of refer to them collectively as Omega World. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, and and like, if you're in Omega World, it's like you've, you know. You've just decided that the omega three is it. That's it, the Messiah. And 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 you can look at any lens, and it's going to take you to the omega three. But you know, I'm sure there's vitamin D world, and I'm oh, yeah. sure there's vitamin C. Oh, world. there's a bunch of those worlds. Yeah, there, there are all these worlds. Mm -hmm. And so you know, as I was like stuck in this omega three, this when I was in this omega world, I asked Michael Pollan about it, and um, you know, if he'd ever come across the omega three, and he was like, oh yeah, <laughs> <You> know, like, <laughs> he, he said he said once you start down this tunnel. It explains everything, like Kazabon's key to all mythologies in Middle March, <laughs> which I then looked into. I had read that book, but I had read it for a while, and I looked back at it. And so Kazabon's key to all myth mythologies, it turns out to be this book that he, this great genius is working on. And then he dies, and his wife goes and find, looks through his notes, and it's completely incomprehensible. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> but that's not to say, I mean, there is, there is serious science about omega-3s. They yeah. are anti-inflammatory. They are 10% of the human brain. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, getting back to your wild issue, 
Um, I think what I concluded at the end of the book was that the, they are the molecule of coolness and wildness. Mm -hmm. Not cool like riding a surfboard yeah, yeah, cool, yeah. but they are an adaptation to a cooler planet mm -hmm. and to a wild planet, which is the planet that I think people like you and I would like more mm -hmm. of. Um, so that by following an omega-3 centered food pattern, you actually are enforcing that cool and wild yeah. way of eating. Yeah, I really like Whereas, that. you know, omega-6s, um, and I can tell you're, you're hip to the to the to the yeah. debate but so omega-6s come to us primarily through things like corn and soy corn and soy oils um mm. and you know they're also essential fatty acids but they can inhibit the body's ability to elongate short chain omega-3 yeah. fatty acids so and the uh, the oft quoted you know story of our ancestry being that we had a one-to-one -one or right. one to three omega-6 to 3 ratio, and now we're, what, like 18 to 20 to 1 or something? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and, and to me, like, I was always kind of all these things. I always was like, okay, all right, tell me more. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, then I took that, you know, there's a famous, in that world, in Omega world, there's a famous physician named Artemis Simopoulos who, who wrote about that paper that you've probably read. And um, I brought that to Walter Willett at the Harvard School, Chan, Chan School of Public Health. And, and, and Dr. Willett is, you know, considered the, one of the world's experts on the Mediterranean diet. And he's like, I've read those fine, I've read her papers, and uh, there's just no evidence that this ratio is an issue. You just have to have enough of each, and that's it. I'm like, okay. But what I thought was interesting, and, and to me, this is the uber theme of the omega principle, is that, okay, omega-3s and omega-6s seem to compete in the human body for space on the same enzymes. But omega-3 food systems and omega-6 food uh, systems compete in the planet mm -hmm. for space yep. of existence. And literally what's happening like in America is that all this corn, all this soy, all this feedlot animals that are grown with all this corn and soy are literally destroying omega-3 food systems. Mm -hmm. Food systems like coastal estuaries, like river systems, um, dead zones are being caused by omega-6 food systems. So that's the, you know. And so it's still the cool and, and wild thing versus the like overheated inflamed thing, right? It's exactly. Like that's what it leads to. Exactly. And whether or not you believe the enzymatic argument on the human body, mm -hmm. there is no doubt that that battle is happening yeah. on a terrestrial versus marine front. Yeah. And even, even you know, even within the realm of terrestrial food, because, you know, omega um, grass-fed animals have much higher levels of omega-3s. Why? Because they brought browse upon grass, which once upon a time was, you know, in the plains of the you know, primeval Midwest had nine foot root structures that held the soil in place mm -hmm. that, you know, kept rivers healthy and all this kind of stuff. Right. And so, you know, I'm not necessarily opposed to eating grass fed animals. We can't, you know, we don't have enough land to grow yeah. enough grass fed animals to right. meet the, For everybody. you know, the, well, at our present consumption levels, mm -hmm. you know, if we're right. going to eat beef every night, there's no way grass-fed. Yeah, it's just interesting. It. Like in Maine, like you could be like, oh, I'm just going to eat grass-fed animals. It's like, no problem. There's a farm down the street. I hook it up. I'm good to go. But then when you scale it out, it's yeah, like, yeah. okay, that's where the challenge is. Well, what I thought was interesting, and again, you know, a lot of the discussion in the Omega Principle is about the Mediterranean diet, or mm -hmm. a lot of it circles yep. back to the Mediterranean diet. And Mediterranean diet, you know, some people don't necessarily believe all of its tenets, but when you look at it, the, the pattern, Mediterranean pattern of eating is to have limited amounts of animal protein a couple times a week at most. That's about what we could do from mm -hmm. a grass-fed perspective. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, it almost like, enforces that. Principle. Yeah, so it's like it's like if we follow a Mediterranean diet, yeah, we could do with yeah. we could do it with seafood and a little bit of grass-fed animals. And, and contrary to what a, a lot of people probably think, I mean, getting that dose of omega three. Daily was like I'm trying to remember. Was it like one sardine or something like that? Well, I think one anchovy. I think it was four something. four anchovies. Or okay, something so like, that. like four anchovies it's, a day. Because I, I think a lot of people would imagine like, wow, you'd have to eat a lot of. Yeah, and it also it depends how you measure it. I mean, so that I think I put that number to give get it up to about 500 milligrams a day, but in Omega World, yeah. it's two grams. Okay, so that's a lot of anchovies. <laughs> yeah. But you, oh, you know, gotta sell bottles of and 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 you know, Omega World takes the. Omega-3 versus omega-6 argument up to this other level where it's like, well, we're so flooded with omega-6s that we just have to push back yeah. <laughs> with even more omega-3s, <laughs> right. which is like, no, let's back down 
on the feedlot yeah. beef, on the on the on the processed food, da 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 da. And if you clear that out, and the vegetable oil, I mean, it's like everybody's eating so much vegetable oil yeah. every day. You know? Yeah, and you know that, and one there's one doctor who I quote in the book who says that you know the introduction of omega six based oils into the American diet is the largest single change in the American diet mm-hmm. that's happened in the last hundred years. A lot of things have changed in the American mm-hmm. diet. You yeah. know, I mean, you know, when I was talking with Marian Nessel, I don't know if you've dealt, talked with her at all, but she wrote Food Politics, a very famous um, clinical nutritionist. And she was saying, like, you know, that what really changed in the Mediterranean in the last 50 years is that, you know, 50 years ago when they did all those amazing studies and showed no heart attacks, et cetera, et cetera, like in Crete, um, they didn't have any roads. Yeah. <laughs> they were just walking up and right. down the hills right. and having a couple of olives right. and calling it a night. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, anyone's going to live to 100 on yeah. that yeah. in that regime. Exactly. You know? But when you suddenly start driving everywhere and, you know, and eating Fritos, you know, that's going to certainly throw you right. Right. <laughs> change a bit. Hey, I don't know if you cover it in the book um, or if this is something I've pieced together from your Instagram and maybe reading some other articles, but mm-hmm. I got the impression that you were doing like a year long diet experiment. Was that I originally did. part of the book story? So, so what happened with that was, um, I mean, you know, when you start out with a book like this, like where the heck do you, how do you write this thing? Yeah. How do you, how do you make a, you know, my favorite quote on the back of the book is from Mark Herlansky who, who says, he says, it takes no small measure of writing skill to make a book about fatty acids gripping. <laughs> well, so thank you, Mark. And it's true. It was hard. And so I needed to figure out a way to personalize it. So one of the things I decided to do was to go on an all-fish diet. It's interestingly, it's interesting that you're asking if it's in the book. It's barely in the book. Yeah. But originally, so I was making that really the spine of the book. And then, so then it was... um. I was at a, I was doing a talk at WGBH in Boston. This very lovely older South African man came up to me. He says, "He's, you know, I really like your books. I'd like to do some work with you at some point. I think, I think it'd be really interesting." And I was like, "Okay." And he's like, "Oh, David Fanning on the Creative Frontline." And I was oh, like, uh, "Wow, you're Creative Frontline." He's like, "Yeah." And so. We did a. He's like he got the money and we like did a movie. Oh wow! And so he's like, can we see that somewhere? Yeah, yeah, it's online. Just, okay, great. Um, and we'll uh, link to it. And so that became the spine of the film. Okay, was me going on an oh, all fish oh, diet. Oh, so that story does get told somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay. so it's got it's it. very much part of that. And I kept putting it into the book, and my editor was like. This might work in the movie, but it's not working in the book because I kept. I, I think that's cool that you didn't have to lean on that as a as a sort of literary device. Well, or whatever. you know, it's like I kept putting it in there, and my editor kept taking it out, and she was right in the end. But you know, <laughs> but but you know, note to self: don't sell a, 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 the rights, film rights, to a book that you haven't read, yeah. <laughs> written yet. <laughs> yeah. But like, you yeah. know, so I would have these things, and I would write these drafts, and I would send them to David Fanning in Boston at, at Frontline, and he'd say. He'd read it. I've read you. He kept saying, "Send me your pages. I want to see pages. Send me your pages." <laughs> and I send the pages. It's like, yeah, you know, I've been reading your pages, and I, I don't think your Omega thing is working. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, "What do you mean, like as a pill or as a concept?" <laughs> like, it is, it's not working. <laughs> and it was like, you know, meanwhile I'm writing this fucking book, <laughs> and then my Omega thing isn't working. Yeah, right. So we, so we, we had to, you know, so eventually. At a certain point, the film and the book parted company. Yeah. And the film became the film. And the film is called The Fish on My Plate. Oh, cool. And it's, I haven't seen it. It's, if you go to Frontline, you'll right. just, if you just Google The Fish yeah. on My Plate, you'll see it. And it's streaming. It's for free. Great. Anyone who wants to see it. But yeah, so I did do that. And um, no no effect. <laughs> no, no, no change in your health or anything. No. I mean, oh, that's fascinating. You know, I mean, I ate fish for breakfast, lunch, and dinner every single day for a year. That's really at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yep. Yeah, and wow. I got my omega three levels quite high. So it turns out there's actually a test yeah, yeah. for your omega three sure. levels. Have you done? The I omega haven't done it, but test? my friends. Uh, yeah, I'd be interested to see your results. Mm-hmm. Um, um, but yeah, so by the end of the year, I had the blood. One one person was saying that oh, in the in omega world was saying that I had the blood of a Sicilian fisherman, circa <laughs> right, 1895. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but but none of the markers that cardi- cardiologists right. look at as key to cardiovascular health change. So my wow. cholesterol did not change. No kidding. My triglycerides did not change. Yeah. My heart rate did not change. My yeah. blood pressure did not change. No kidding. Well, for you now um, that you're done with that, what's like your sustainable number of fish meals a week? Well, like again, a- I go back to the Mediterranean model, right? Which is because in addition to having 
no change in my cardiovascular indicators. I had very high mercury. Oh, yeah. So high that, you know, I was at a when I got the numbers, I was happened to be in Alaska with Frontline and um, with a public health guide. And I said, well, what would you say if you got numbers like this from one of your people out in the in the villages? And he said, well, if we got numbers that high, we'd send somebody out to your village and tell you to stop eating so much <laughs> whale blubber. <laughs> right. so, so, oh. so anyway, so once I backed down from whatever, you know, 20, what are the three meals? 21, yeah, 21 meals, one meals seafood a meals a week to a couple of meals a week. Again, to Mediterranean diet levels, yeah. all those problems went away. Oh, yeah. That mercury and, level came down. Oh, yeah. You didn't have to chelate or do any kind of therapies or anything. Oh, that's interesting. No, you just no. purge it. Yeah. I mean, who knows? I mean, who knows? Maybe it's, maybe I do need to chelate. Yeah. I don't know. But if you chest my hair, which is, yeah, you know, most people right. think that. What you're excreting. Yeah. I mean, most people feel, it, the, most people when they go to their doctors, they get a blood test for mercury, but that's useless. I mean, mm -hmm. that's just a record of transient mercury in your system. If you really want to know the record of what you're yeah. eating, you do a hair test. I know this because at the time I was writing an, or an article about a really cool scientist um, who had done a huge mercury study of birds in um, the Shenandoah Valley. DuPont had polluted this um, tributary mm -hmm. of the Shenandoah. And so he had an in-house mercury tester. So I would just oh. clip my hair and oh, periodically cool. send it no off kidding. to Dan for oh, free. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> So, so there, because there's that argument going that the selenium is a buffer. Yes. And so clearly it wasn't for you. Well, maybe it was. Yeah. I mean, this is just what you've excreted into your hair. So it's not like it's. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the point of that selenium argument is right, isn't it? That it, my neurons were somehow. Per yeah. It doesn't necessarily. It, it, it doesn't right. like eliminate Keep it out the mercury. From absorption. Okay. So, right. um, you know, I have to say, my I have my own skepticism about the mercury scare mm -hmm. because um, how old are you? I'm 40. 40. So are you old enough to remember this very famous picture called Tomo Uma Mora in her bath? Um, if you Google it, Google image search it, um, there was this pollution event oh, um, yeah. in the I, Bay of Minamata. I've, which I know about from documentaries only. Yeah. So in the Bay of Minamata, this company called the Shiso Company Corporation dumped all of this mercury into this bay where people are actually catching shellfish. And uh, the famous photograph is of a child – who's so horribly disfigured from it. And it's like a pieta, like mm. this woman is holding up her disfigured uh, child in the bath. So that image burned into the retinas mm -hmm. of millions of Americans. Okay. And so they think that, you know, eating fish, they're going to end up with Tomo and Memora right, in their bath. Right, right, right. But when you look at Minamata disease, you're talking about hundreds of parts per million. Yeah. My mercury went from you know, one part per million, which is considered the threshold, to five parts per million. Okay. It didn't go up to hundreds. Hundreds of parts. And then you have, like, the nation of Japan. Yeah, you know, exactly. Like, which eats, <laughs> yeah. you know, like... Canary we, in the coal mine. <laughs> like, we eat 15 pounds of seafood a year, like, per person in America. And in Japan and China, they're eating 120, 130 pounds of seafood. Yeah. Like, did you ever hear about the very <sighs> mentally impaired Chinese and Japanese? Yeah, yeah, they're really struggling they're mentally They're really struggling over there. mentally. <laughs> So I, I have my doubts, and yeah. I and I mean I know that's a, not a popular view yeah. in the environmental community because there is this funny um, synchronization with pollution and ending fishing. Yeah, right? yeah, oh, yeah. So it's like don't don't catch any fish because they're 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 bad You're, for you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I get worried about that. You've said several times you've referred to the book as the the books as a trilogy. Yeah. Are, is it done or are you going to keep writing on the topic? Three have been written. Four <laughs> shall not rise. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, well, maybe, you know, like, you know, Creed, you know, like if you've. Are you into the Rocky The Cre movies? Creed. Oh, we were just talking about yeah. it. Like, you know, Rocky. Mouthies. You know, Rocky. Oh, Creed. Apollo Creed. Uh, yeah. Apollo Creed. I was thinking Apollo. Yeah. I was like, Rocky. Creed the I was band. Like, the Rocky. No, like, like Rocky, you yeah. know, th there were like, my son went on a Rocky jag, and we watched all of them once that I never oh, was, like, wanted. five or six now? Yeah, it just goes on and on. But, you know, eventually Rocky, there's no plausible case that Rocky could still be in the ring. Right. But then Creed appears. <laughs> yeah, right. And now this winter, we have Creed 2 coming oh, out. Oh, okay, okay. So, like, you know, I so maybe you know. my son will carry it. But no, in all seriousness my agent actually came to me and said you know michael pollan did a book called food rules which is you know did really well and it's like it's like this big. yeah i remember it and um and my agent said why don't we do seafood rules that'd be great because there's like oh, right now people get um most of that information there's three or four websites right that yeah kind of 
But I dare you. You write that book. No way, man. But because, you've written the article a bunch of times. No, but but the thing is, it always changes, and yeah. there are you know, and it is more complicated than it. I mean, I think people expect there's going to be a really simple answer. to Yeah, all and this. and pollen, you know, pollen's a genius in coming up with these things. Like you know, don't eat food that your grandmother wouldn't recognize as mm-hmm. food. The genius of that line, right, is that there's no empirical science to mm-hmm. tell one way or another. It's just that your grandmother ate food. Yeah. And sh- nobody fucked with her food yeah. the way big indi- industrial food companies do. With fish, don't eat sardines except if they're from the Bay of Biscayne <laughs> on a Thursday, <laughs> on a Thursday. <laughs> after a rainfall. You know what I mean? Like, there's so many qualifiers that yeah. you can't get these crystalline mm-hmm. um, reductions. I mean, I tried. Yeah. I tried. I wrote the proposal. Right. And it's like, so, I don't know. Right now, I'm just... Um, I, so where I'm thinking about going right now, so we, where we are right now is, you know, we're stone's throw from ground zero. And I actually have a garden. Um, I have an 800 square foot terrace and I grow, um, I supply about half of our family's vegetable needs. No way, really? In the summertime. Oh, wow. at least. Yeah. Cool. And I also produce one bottle of wine per year. <laughs> it's called Chateau Nul. Um, you know. uh, highly coveted. <laughs> well, you know, Chateau Nul because zero. Nul mm-hmm. is zero in French. Yeah. But also in French, if you want to say somebody is like a total loser. Oh, yeah. Chateau Nul. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, so I'm, I'm working on a proposal now for a book called The Ground Zero Gardener. Oh, neat. Which looks at the six or seven major vectors, the way humans impact the earth. Yeah. But just like Four Fish starts out with Every chapter starts out with like a fishing experience to explore the wild, mm-hmm. wider world of fishing. Everything starts with a problem in my garden. Yeah, and then oh, right, adventure. Right. Of which there's through. surely no shortage. Yeah, we don't have deer on the tenth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say if you do, I'll come take care of that problem. For you. I, I just I suddenly see like a Mission Impossible deer. Like <laughs> <laughs> you might, you might just see that. Oh, so that'll be good. You'll get you sort of um, out of the water and dried off a little well, bit. Well, yeah. Also, it's just I'm tired of traveling a bit. Yeah. You know, like, I mean, this Omega book took me to Antarctica. It took me to, you know, Norway to, I mean, it did take me to the Amalfi yeah. Coast. Somebody has to do that. <laughs> um, but I, you know, it's, my son's on the verge of teenagerdom and I feel like, uh, you know, I don't want to get my house trashed. Right. While, while <laughs> right, 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 right. While you're gone. <laughs> Although, you did, have you noticed this? I was in a diner the other day and there was like a like a little psa on the little piece the placemat it said parents who let their party happen at their house are response are are liable are legally liable it's like holy shit i'm not leaving this (laughs) yeah yeah exactly (laughs) don't tell my mom about that yeah um kind of to wrap it up uh i'm curious when you look at the big picture of how, if you're optimistic or pessimistic about what human beings, what how do I say it? Um, our the future that we're making is it inhabitable? This planet is it not? I mean, surely you think about this stuff a lot uh, yeah. more than most people. And uh, there's so much negative news, but there's constantly positive news too. And then sometimes the negative news turns out to be hype mm-hmm. or or slanted in that direction. So. Yeah, when you look at it, do you think we're figuring this thing out? Um, and this is just a, a tough bottleneck we're going through, or, or well, does it get way worse? I mean, we have all of the tools. You know, it's a little bit like in A Star is Born. You got you have the whole package. You got the voice. You get that. You know. uh, I, I sent her alone to that one. I stayed home. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway. No, but we, we have all the tools we need to fix most of the problems yeah. in the world. And the only thing standing between us and a sustainable planet are like primitive superstitions yeah. and greed and political short-sightedness. Yeah. 50 years ago when – was it Paul Ehrlich who wrote the with the population bomb or something? Okay. We didn't have that stuff. Yeah. You know, Now we have energy systems ready to go. Like if we want to, we can do it. Um, we have, you know, a very sophisticated understanding of what we need to do to improve our farming we have aquaculture, which can have a much lower carbon impact than growing cows. We have all these things. We have all these things. So it's really like if we could turn it all over to like a logic-based AI, yeah, the AI would solve it. Uh, yeah, you know, unless it turned the world into yeah, exactly. gray, ah! gray goo. Elon like Musk it. says, "Don't do it." No, well, right. I mean, that's the problem. It's like if we could program the right, mm-hmm. the right AI. No, I mean a all, benevolent AI. Benevolent AI. Um, 
But we, uh, but you say that obviously to illustrate that the fact that these are logical problems that have solutions. Yeah, all the solutions are there. It's like mm-hmm. it's just not you know it's like we don't have to invent nuclear fusion mm-hmm. to solve the carbon issue. Right. Like we we actually are there, and yep. it's like you know the incredible decline in solar prices. Um, mm-hmm. You know, if, from a fisheries perspective. Um, I'll just throw this in so your block so your um, podcast is really popular. Right. We have blockchain <laughs> and Bitcoin. No. <laughs> like, have you seen the John yeah. Oliver blockchain? No, no, uh, no. Bit- Bitcoin thing is very funny. Okay. Like if you add Bitcoin or blockchain to your brain, oh, you does it? It, it just it really like, like it's, it's just like blo- blockchain iced tea now. Like, so oh, okay, like Delta sure. Um, but but. With blockchain technology, I was doing the omega three thing for this. I'm way behind. Yeah, I yeah, that was no. what was going to work. <laughs> omega block, omega three blockchain. Ooh, that would really, that's a new product. Blockchain omega three. So, um, no, but you know, now with some of it is blockchain, but some of it's other stuff. We can actually track every fishing vessel in the world. Yeah. and see exactly what they're doing if we want to. Yeah. But you know, my friend uh, Ian Urbina, who wrote that great series called The Outlaw Ocean for the New York Times, um, was saying that like. You know, there's this whole gray area of the high seas that the nations of the world kind of like having. Yeah. Like, you know, legal, uh, the rule of law kind of depends weirdly on this big gray spot Mm -hmm. where there is no rule of law. Wow. And so, you know, that just comes down to the human brain and, Mm -hmm. and the human and human societies and the the failure of human society to really deal with its own shit and that's going to be what wipes us out or if we conquer it that's what's going to be our ultimate sublimation paul thanks for your time today my pleasure thanks for having me thanks for listening to the wild fed podcast you can help us grow the show by subscribing and leaving us a rating and review it ensures better rankings and more advertiser interest which translates directly into better shows more awesome guests and a constant stream of fresh new content Have a question you'd like answered on the show or a hunting, fishing, or foraging trip you'd like to host us on? Email us at info at wild-fed.com. And be sure to visit our website, wild-fed.com, to check out the Wild Fed video show and store. Wild Fed. Food is all around you.